Well, welcome, Woodlands Church. Listen, we are so excited to have you worship with us again. Wherever you are, we're just glad that we can worship God in spirit and in truth. For the last few weeks, we've simply been declaring that with God, anything is possible. So wherever you are, let's just sing that out together. There is no shadow that has ever overcome your life. And there is no rival that could ever stand against your might. You've always been with us. Ah, yes. Every battle you've already won, oh, you've already won. Sing this out. And there is no weapon that has ever left a mark on you. And there is no army, no, with the power to conquer truth. You've always been with us. Every battle you've already won, you've already won. Yes, you have. Cause he's 
He's the God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. Say that out together. Show me one thing that's too high. Show me what I'm in camp. Cause he's the God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. It's possible. Well, welcome to Woodlands Church, and isn't it great to be able to sing and worship together that with God, anything is possible. And isn't that true? We are so excited about what God has been doing here at Woodlands Church, and I'm telling you, today's service is going to be powerful. So let me encourage you right now, text a friend, invite them to church. I want you to try to go back and remember your first time to church. Maybe you grew up in church. Maybe it was your parents who grew up bringing you to church, but there's a good chance that for a lot of you, you came to church, you came to Woodlands Church because someone invited you. You saw an invitation. Maybe it was a commercial invitation from Pastor Kerry and Chris Shook, or maybe it was a friend or a neighbor, but people come to church when they're invited. I encourage you right now to take out your cell phone, text someone and invite them to be a part of today's service because it is going to be a fantastic service. Pastor Lee Strobel is wrapping up his series on grace and truth. Last week, what a powerful, encouraging message on grace. If you haven't seen it, go back and watch it. But today you're gonna be really encouraged as he brings a message about truth. How to allow our lives to match the character of God and the way that we speak honesty and how there's so much value and so much uh, reward when we honor the Lord with the way that we speak and the way that we carefully guard over the things that we say and how we say them, that we're honest, that we speak the truth. You're going to be encouraged today. It's going to be a great message. And I'm going to tell you something, at Woodlands Church, not only are we going to be encouraged by what happened this weekend, but I want you to be encouraged by what Woodlands Church has been doing ministry-wise over the last several weeks. Our student ministry, we just came off of uh, the back-to-back day camps a couple of weeks ago. It was incredible. We saw 99 faith commitments to Christ, uh, kids who followed him in baptism outside, and so many other students who have started ministries after that point. And God really began to create some new connections there. And of course we were safe. We were, you did sanitation and social distancing and we wore the safety equipment and we did pre-screening, but the connection was incredible. And we are excited to keep that connection going and the safety going as we restart our live student services this Wednesday night, our 7 p.m. service. It's gonna be incredible. We're gonna be here at six o'clock being able to do our screening. We'll have safety equipment, of course, and, and we'll be sanitized, but it's gonna be a powerful time of connection, especially as our students start back to school. We know that that daily connection with the Lord and with their friends is a big part of continuing for them to step into what the Lord has for their life. So don't miss that. It's gonna be incredible. We encourage you to get your students there. But then also our children's ministry has been killing it like never before. They have always done an incredible job with their kids services that we host here at Woodlands Church. But since we haven't been able to meet here on campus in person, they have taken their show on the road. We did a couple of weeks of VBS on tour. That's our vacation Bible school that we normally host here on campus. We've been taking that on the road in the neighborhoods and we call it WC Kids on tour. Our Woodland Church Kids ministry team on tour out in the neighborhoods. And they've been to over a hundred different neighborhoods in our community, ministering to over 3,500 people, many of whom it It's neighbors of church members and people who uh, are coming to hear the gospel and their kids, some of them for the very first time. And it has been an incredible journey. And we are, they are this week developing all new shows. So starting next Saturday, we're gonna be revisiting a lot of the same locations that we've been at. We're gonna be going to some new locations. And so if you would like to host a show or find a show, just go to wc.org slash events and you can click on there to host a show or find a show that's near you because we are gonna keep this going. Until we are able to open up for our kids, we are gonna continue to bring the good news of the gospel to your neighborhood. We're gonna continue to bring the joy and the excitement of our kids' church and their services and shows to your neighborhoods. So don't let your kids miss out on that. It is a ton of fun and there's there's free popsicles, right? So which kid doesn't want that as well? It really is a great experience and so packed full of truth. But not only have our student ministry and our kids' ministry really been crushing it over the last few weeks, we've also been as a church trying to meet the needs of those who are under-resourced in our communities and those who on the front lines of battling this virus and our healthcare workers and meeting them right where they are through a a program that we have been calling Operation Overflow. 
letting the love of the Lord and what he's done in our life, letting that overflow into our community and and continuing to meet the needs of those people who need it the most. And so let me tell you just a little bit about what you have been able to do as a church through your faithfulness, what we've been able to do as a church as we continue to respond to the needs of our community. We have been able and we've been at and ministered to 10 different hospitals. Well, what does that mean? Well, just a part of what that means is, is beyond the encouragement and the excitement and things that we've been doing of, of waiting for them on shift change and shouting for them and encouraging them and holding up signs, we've also served 6,400 meals to hospital staff. That is unbelievable. And, and beyond hospitals, like I said, we've been going out and meeting the needs of those that are under-resourced during this time that, that really need the help and need provision during this time. And We've been able as a church to deliver 49 tons of fresh food to those in need. I I struggle to even wrap my head around what that means. 98,000 pounds of fresh food to those in need because of your faithfulness. Wow, unbelievable. We've also been able to distribute 5,656 boxes of food to the under-resourced. And, and as we launch back into school, we've got things going on, kids trying to get back into school and they have their needs for our under-resourced families. As a church, we've been able to provide 2,100 backpacks to kids going back to school, stuffed full of the school supplies they need this year to make things go. It's really been unbelievable. And then as far as preparing meals and, and fresh meals and serving them to those who are in need, we've been able to prepare 33,216 fresh meals that have been served. It's been unbelievable the way that God has been using you as a church during this time. Just just look at this video. It'll show you a little bit about what I'm talking about. Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. 
that you sing this song. God, we need a fresh move of your spirit today. I don't know where you are right now. And you feel like you think you're too far from God, and God says, no, I'm right here. Bless in revival. Come on, we sing it out. now. A move of your spirit. Hi, everybody. We're in the second week of our mini-series called Grace and Truth. I want to talk today about telling the truth. What does that mean, telling the truth? And I want to hearken back to a true story uh, about a guy who lived about, I don't know, 300 years ago uh, in England. He was the commander of a merchant ship, and his name was Captain Fudge. Is that not a great name? Captain Fudge. I always wondered, was he friends with Captain Crunch? I I don't know if he was, but (laughs) the thing about Captain Fudge is that he became notorious for telling tall tales, for exaggerating his improbable adventures he supposedly had on the high seas. In fact, his name became so identified with lying that whenever his crew would hear someone else tell a tall tale, they would point at him and they would say, fudge, fudge. Well, after a while, his fame spread all the way to America, so that by the mid-1800s, when kids tried to cheat in marbles, their opponents would say, hey, no fudging. And to this day, the word fudging is used when we talk about cheating or lying or hedging. Uh He's fudging on his taxes. Or that candidate made a lot of promises, but when he got into office, he started fudging on everything. Or you might inflate the figures in the budget that you submit to your boss uh, so that you have a fudge factor. I mean, let's face it, everybody fudges at some time or the other. None of us, even though we try to be, none of us is totally honest all the time. There are times that we exaggerate. There are times when we break commitments, even though we try not to. In fact, we can trace that behavior all the way back to the opening scenes of the Bible, where Adam fudged by blaming Eve for the way he violated God's command. 
and where Cain killed his brother and fudged when God asked him about it. And we have been feasting on fudge ever since. In fact, there was a study a few years ago that showed that two out of three Americans have no hesitation to lie if it suits their purposes. Actually, Time Magazine featured a cover story with the headline, Lying. Everybody's doing it. Honest. (laughs) I mean, it's this tendency to lie that prompted Jesus to address the topic of truth-telling and commitment-keeping in his Sermon on the Mount. Now, to appreciate his teachings, you need to understand that lying was so common in those days that people would often use an oath or a vow to try to convince others that they were really being truthful. Actually, some people continue to this day to use oaths. They'll say something like, as God is my witness, or I swear in a stack of Bibles, or may God strike me with lightning if I'm not telling the truth. I mean, those are oaths. When people would swear an oath, what they were doing is calling on God to be a witness to their truthfulness and inviting him to punish them if they were lying. In other words, invoking God's name was supposed to add some credibility to what they were saying. Now, in the Old Testament, God permitted oaths to be sworn in his name if the situation was solemn and if it was a necessary um, condition. And of course, people to this day, when you go into a court of law and you're going to be a witness, you are sworn in, you swear an oath that you're going to tell the truth. But Leviticus chapter 19, verse 12, had a warning. It said, do not swear falsely by my name and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. And because God's people are so petrified of profaning his name, whenever they would invoke God in an oath, they do everything they could to make sure that they would keep their promise. But that's just frustrating them. Why? Because we all have a tendency to want to fudge. So, What did the religious leaders of the day do? They came up with loopholes, with loopholes. They said, you know what? If we swear by God's name, then we're absolutely bound to be truthful. But what if we swore by something less than God's name? Then we could maybe be less than truthful. And so they started a little game. They started swearing by heaven or by earth, or by the temple, or by their head, which meant by their own life, so they could feel free to fudge. Now, Jesus loved to demolish deceptive and hypocritical and rule-dominated religious systems, and instead to zero in on the true intentions of the human heart. And that's what he did in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, starting at verse 33, when he addressed this question of truth-telling and commitment-keeping. This is what he said. Again, you have heard that it was said to the people long ago, do not break your oath, but fulfill to the Lord the vows you have made. But I tell you, do not swear an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great God. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. In other words, stop fudging. Stop fudging. Jesus was saying, it's absurd that you can think that you can lie when you swear by heaven or earth or by Jerusalem or your head because all of them were created by God. And falsely swearing by any part of God's creation profanes his name. And then after saying what people shouldn't do, Jesus told us what we should do. And again, he was very succinct. Verse 37, he said, all you need to say is simply yes or no. Anything beyond this comes from the evil one. I mean, what's simpler than that? If you make a commitment to do something, then do it. If you say something, be truthful. If you make a promise, fulfill it. If you describe something, don't exaggerate. Uh, when you live that way consistently, if that's what your life is about, that kind of adherence to honesty, you don't need to have a vow. You don't need to have an oath. That's merely superfluous. 
Do you know anybody like that? Someone who is as good as their word. Well, they stand out in a crowd today, and they did back in Jesus' day as well. I'll give you an example of someone who stood out. Seven-year-old uh, kid by the name of Tanner Muncy. He lived in Florida, and uh, he became so famous for his truth-telling, he ended up in the pages of Sports Illustrated magazine. Let me tell you the story. Uh, Tanner was playing a little league game, and he was first baseman, and the ball is hit to him, and he reaches out to tag a base runner who was running from first to second. And the umpire said, out. But Tanner said, "Um, sir, excuse me, I missed him. And the umpire said, what do you mean? He said, I I reached out with the ball to tag him, but I actually missed him. And so the umpire said, well, okay. And he reversed his ruling and called the player safe. (laughs) <laughs> Could you imagine a major league baseball player doing something like that? Could you imagine in an NBA championship game, one of the players tapping a referee on the shoulder and saying, excuse me, but back there in the other end of the court, I fouled a guy. I don't think you saw me, but I really did foul him. You really need to give that guy some free throws. <laughs> I mean, that would, that would make the front page of the newspaper if that happened. But listen to what else took place with seven-year-old Tanner Muncy. Then two weeks later, he was playing in another Little League game. The same umpire was there. This time, Tanner was playing shortstop. The ball is hit to him. He goes to tag a runner. And the umpire says, safe. But he senses something is troubling Tanner. So he says, something wrong? And Tanner says, yeah, I tagged him. The umpire said, what do you mean? He said, well, I reached out with the ball, and I tagged him. And so what did the umpire do? He reversed his call. He called the runner out. And the opposing manager came storming out of the dugout and said, what in the world's going on? And the umpire said to him, in effect, look, that young man has already shown me he is a truth teller. And if he says the runner is out, then the runner is out. I mean, that's what Jesus wants his followers to be known as. Truth tellers, commitment keepers, promise fulfillers, people who are as good as their word. They stand out from society's background noise of deception, deceit, and dishonesty. I mean, he wants that for our own sake. He wants it for our own reputations. He wants it for our character development and for healthy relationships and for our self-esteem and for our peace of mind. There are so many benefits when we just simply tell the truth. So I want to look at the practical side of this. I want to look at three specific areas and how it is that we can kind of up our truth-telling. The first area is casual commitments. Casual commitments. By casual commitments, I mean those offhanded promises that we make to colleagues and friends and family members and classmates. Uh, And often we make these casual commitments out of good intentions, but we don't really take them seriously enough to fulfill them. And the fallout is that others are hurt and that God is offended because he is a God of truth and any falsehood is an affront to God. Ecclesiastes 5 verse 5 says, It is better not to make a vow than to make one and not fulfill it. So here are some casual commitments that people often fudge on. Here's one. The doctor will be with you shortly. (laughs) Have you ever heard that one? I mean, you're in the little office, you know, and you're in your underwear and it's freezing in there. And they say, the doctor will be in here shortly. And you're waiting and you're waiting. And I don't know if you're like me, but I usually go over to the doctor's desk and I make a little little fort out of the tongue depressors and everything. And then you're embarrassed when the doctor comes in, but he ain't coming in anytime soon. Or we'll do lunch sometime soon. I mean, how many times do we throw out that line, but it never really happens? And we tend to forget we ever made the comment, but the other person remembers it, and they feel devalued when we don't follow through. Or, I'll take just a minute of your time. 
Really? 60 seconds or less? You're just going to take a minute of my time? How often does that get fulfilled? Or, honey, you can count on me to do half the, ho- uh, the housework. I mean, guys, your wife loves you too much to call you on that one. But, you know, when we make that casual commitment, I'll do half the housework. Do we really? Or do we really make, uh, you know, fulfill the commitment when we say, uh, you know, I'll change half the diapers or uh, I'll do half the feedings at 2 a.m.? Or how about the check is in the mail? I mean, if all the checks were in the mail, the people said were in the mail, the post office would clog and, and, and shut down. Or here's one. Don't worry. This sermon will be on the short side. I mean, I'm guilty of fudging on that quite a bit. I mean, that's just a sampling of a few casual commitments we make. And it happens all the time. It happens in marriage when we say, I'll be home tonight on time for sure. Or I know we haven't spent a lot of time together for a while, but I'll make up for it next month. Or let's have a date night every week this year. Or it happens with our kids. When we say, I'll come to every one of your soccer games. Or I'll be at every one of your dance recitals. And then we are. Or we promise, you know, we're going to have a great family vacation this year. But then things happen and we never fulfill it. I mean, I was guilty of this when my kids were little. I remember working at a church, and I was, I was overwhelmed at the time. I was working long hours. I was spending far too much time away from the family. And I was feeling bad about it. So I said to my son, Kyle, who was little at the time, I said, hey, Kyle, um, I know I've been gone a lot, but the Cubs are playing uh, later today. Um, how about if I come home early from work, I'll pick you up, we'll go to Wrigley Field, we'll see a Cubs game. He said, oh, wow, that'd be great. So I went to work. And sure enough, I got bogged down in things that were going on, the responsibilities, things that were happening. And by the time I looked at my watch, it was too late to take my son to the game. And I, I can literally close my eyes and, and, and relive this scene when I pulled into our driveway. And there was my son sitting on the front step with his Cubs hat on and his baseball mitt on. And I went over and I said, Kyle, I'm so sorry. I got tied up at work and we're not going to be able to go to the game today. But, you know, uh, maybe another day uh, we'll do it. But here's what really got me. He wasn't mad at me. He, He wasn't angry by that. He just said, okay, and he walked away. And I thought, I would be mad if that happened to me. And then I realized, why is he not mad? Because this has become the routine. That he has gotten used to me breaking these little promises to him. Failing to fulfill the commitments that I made to him. It just has become such a common occurrence that it started to just roll off his back. Friends, kids are easily bruised by broken commitments. I mean, they're naive enough to just expect our yes to be yes and our no to be no. And when we fudge on little things like that, pretty soon they don't believe anything about you anymore. And pretty soon they start making commitments to you, things like where they're going to go or who they're going to hang out with or the things they're going to look at at the Internet. And you know what? They're going to start fudging just like you taught them to. Friends, every time, A casual commitment is broken. There's an incremental amount of damage that is done. Credibility is diminished. Trust is eroded. People feel devalued. Relationships are strained. And God is offended. Because even though we're casual about promises we make, he takes things very seriously. And so what should we do? What should we do? Let me just offer two suggestions. First, if what I've said so far has um, caused you to think about a broken commitment that you've made, a broken promise, um, go and apologize to the person involved and just be honest with them and say, you know, I I intended to to do this. I know I didn't. And honestly, I'm sorry for that. And I'm going to really try to be more scrupulous in the future about keeping my commitments. But go to them. And just apologize. 
And then the second thing we can do is, if we've been sloppy about keeping casual commitments, develop a new habit starting this week. And it takes a little training of your mind to do this, but over time, it, it, it kicks in and, and it becomes a reflexive thing. So here's what you do. Whenever you find yourself about to make a casual commitment, let's have lunch next week or whatever. Before you open your mouth, ask yourself, am I really going to fulfill this commitment or not? Am I just fudging? Am I just trying to make the other person feel better by saying something that I'm going to do when I'm really not going to do it? Just just pause long enough to ask yourself, am I really going to do what I say I'm going to do? And if the answer is no, then either don't say it or say it accurately. I'd like to have lunch next week, but man, my my schedule is kind of up in the air. I can't promise anything. I don't know for sure. Uh, As soon as I know something for sure, I'll I'll give you a call and let you know. And that's a little more precise and honest than just saying, yeah, I'll see you next week. But hopefully over time, then, you know, our casual commitments can become careful commitments. The second area I want to talk about are corporate commitments. Corporate commitments. By that, I mean promises that you make in the marketplace. Commitments to give your boss a full day of work for a full day of pay. Or treating your employees honestly and fairly. Or being honest in your expense report or on your taxes. Or following through with promises that you make to your clients or to your customers. Proverbs 10 verse 9 says, Whoever walks in integrity walks securely, but whoever takes crooked paths will be found out. I mean, think about it. When we pursue our careers with integrity, we don't have to spend time fretting that someone's going to uncover our lies. We don't have to endure kind of this low-key, ongoing uh, uh, sense of anxiety that we're going to get caught at doing something. We don't have to stockpile excuses. We don't have to weave elaborate rationalizations. We can sleep at night without ambient. I like the way the business expert, Ken Blanchard, put it. He said, there is no pillow as soft as a clear conscience. I mean, even the the Harvard Business Review backs up the teachings of the Bible. Listen to what it says. It says, to be a winner, a person must play to win. This does not mean that he must be ruthless, cruel, harsh, or treacherous. On the contrary... The better his reputation for integrity, honesty, and decency, the better his chances for victory will be in the long run. So Harvard Business Review matches up with what Scripture tells us. Now, sometimes in the marketplace, we're faced with business decisions that aren't particularly clear-cut in terms of what is the truly honest thing to do. Uh, That's why people who are committed to honesty Um, uh, in their careers really do a lot of prayerful consideration um, of the steps that they take. In other words, when they're in some hot spots like employee relations or financial dealings, those are kind of the areas where you get a lot of issues involving honesty and integrity and so forth. They're especially prayerful and careful in those hot spots. Some develop accountability relationships with like-minded people who are in the same profession so that they can help each other grapple with the unique integrity issues in that specific business. So to give you an example, um, if if you own a restaurant um, and you come to me and you're looking for advice on how to handle certain nuances to be honest in your business as a restaurateur, I I don't know how helpful I can really be. I can't be as helpful as a another person who is also in the restaurant business, who's also a mature Christian, who you can have a relationship with, and who knows the ins and outs of that business, and who you can call up periodically and say, hey, have you ever faced this particular dilemma before? Because I want to be honest here. I want to do the right thing. I want to tell the truth. I want to fulfill my commitment. But I'm not quite sure how it plays out in this situation. And they have the other person say, oh, man, I faced that two years ago. Here's what I found along the way. Do you have a relationship like that? Is there someone in a similar business as yours 
who's a mature Christian who you can build that kind of accountability friendship with. That goes a long way in helping us maintain our integrity in the marketplace. I know it, you know, it, it can get dicey. It can get tricky. Uh, some things are not as easy to discern as others, but Jesus, in effect, says, guard your integrity for your own sake and for the sake of your business. And then the third category I want to talk about are kingdom commitments, kingdom commitments. These are the spiritual commitments that we make uh, in our spiritual life that are often easy to accidentally or unintentionally break. Commitments involving uh, serving or giving or whatever. But I want to talk about one because it's so common, and, and that's the commitment to pray for somebody else. You know, often you have people, I'm sure, who come up to you, friends or whatever, and say, would you pray for me? I've got a huge exam at school coming up. Would you pray for me? Or, you know, we're really struggling in the midst of this pandemic uh, financially. Uh, Would you pray for me? Uh, Or my kids are really so rebellious lately. I'm not quite sure what to do. Would you pray for me? That, friends, is a sacred request. I mean, take that incredibly seriously. When anybody comes to you and asks you to pray for them, they are trusting you that you will lift up them to the Lord. That is a sacred thing. And sometimes we say, yeah, sure, I'll pray for you. And we intend to do it, but we forget. Or we just don't take it as seriously as it needs to be taken. Listen to how the paraphrase of the Bible, the message, renders Matthew chapter 5, uh, verse 37. It says, you only make things worse when you lay down a smokescreen of pious talk, saying, I'll pray for you and never do it, or saying, God be with you and not meaning it. So how do we deal with this? I found some things out over the years. Two ideas I'll give to you. The first idea is this. If somebody asks you to pray for them, Write it down right then. You know, we all have uh, some sort of iPhone or, or, or cell phone. Most of them have a place you can uh, either send yourself a note or a, a, a memo section that you can make a list of people you're praying for. Add them to the list right then and there so you don't forget. And then at your prayer time, you can take that out and make sure you're, oh, yeah, I got to pray for Jack. Jack's going through a tough time. And you make sure you fulfill that sacred promise to pray for someone else. The other thing is to pray for the person right then and there. I mean, um, you know, sometimes this surprises people, but this is what I do generally. If somebody comes up to me and asks me to pray for them, I say, well, let me pray right now. And I put my hand on their shoulder and I close my eyes and I pray for them right at that moment. I remember I was at a restaurant right here in the woodlands one day um, with a friend of mine. And uh, we got into a conversation with a woman and found out she was going in for cancer treatment. And um, she was really nervous about it, obviously, and, and uh, understandably. And so right, right then and there in the restaurant, we just, we just, you know, gathered together and we prayed for her. That way you don't have to, you know, take the risk of forgetting to do it. It's a sacred opportunity to minister to another person. Let's seize those opportunities to make sure that we follow through. Now, the truth is, you know, from time to time, we all fail in meeting all of our commitments. We all fudge a bit. But you know what the good news is? God doesn't fudge. God doesn't fail. God fulfills his commitments to us, especially, especially. 1 John 1, verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. God always keeps his commitments. In fact, let me end with a story about truth-telling and honesty, something that happened to me a few years ago when I was a pastor at a church up in Chicago. And one day I answered the phone and a guy said, hey, Lee, um, is a friend of mine from the church, and he said, hey, I got something really embarrassing to tell you. And I said, oh, man, what's this about? <laughs> I said, what? He said, well, 
You know our little daughter, eight years old, she shoplifted a book from the church bookstore. And she's a good kid, you know, this is totally out of character for her, but she stole this book, and um, I'm wondering if you'd do us a favor. I said, well, sure, anything. He said, well, would you sort of uh, represent the church and, and let us come and have her um, uh, admit this and, and confess this to you, uh, uh, representing the church, and then maybe work out some sort of restitution um, and, and, and penalty that she could pay to make up for it? And I said, yeah. He said, we kind of like to make this a lesson. And I thought, you know what? There's another lesson I think I want to make here, but let's do it. So the next day, him and his wife came into my office with their little eight-year-old daughter. And she, she walked in. I mean, she, she looked like she had the weight of the world on her shoulders. She's kind of hunched over, and she walks in. She sits down in a chair, and she's so small, the chair just kind of swallowed her up. And so we had some initial small talk, and then I came around my desk and kind of sat on the edge of the desk, and I, and I looked at the little girl, and I said, uh, honey, t- tell me what happened. And so her little lip started to quiver, and she said, oh, I, I was in Sunday school class, and we got out, and, and I took a shortcut through the church bookstore, and I saw this book, and, and I really wanted it, but I didn't have any money, and And I knew it was wrong. I knew I shouldn't do it, but I took the book and I I put it under my coat and I took it. I I knew it was wrong. I'll never do it again. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. And she started to cry and I gave her a tissue and she wiped her little tears. and, And I said, honey, I'm so proud of you. I said, this is the right thing to do. That when you do something wrong, you admit it, you confess it. You ask forgiveness, you say you're sorry. And, and you've done that, and I am proud of you for doing that. And, and I said, what do you think an appropriate punishment for this would be? And she kind of shook her head. She didn't know. And I said, well, I had heard, by the way, from the parents earlier that she had thrown the book away to uh, kind of get rid of the evidence. So the book was no longer around. So I said to her, well, here's what I think would be fair. I understand the book costs $5. So what if you repaid the church $5 for the book plus three times that amount for a penalty? So that would be $20. Do you think that would be fair? And she looked at me and she, she nodded, but I could see in her eyes a sense of panic. I mean, she didn't have the $5 to buy the book in the first place. She, $20, she didn't have $20. $20, a mountain of money for a little kid like that. And so I could see this panicky look in her eyes, like, uh, yeah, I can see the fairness, but I, I don't have any idea where I would ever get $20. And so she said, yeah, I, I, I see the fairness of that. And so I got up and I went behind my desk. I sat in my chair and I pulled open my center drawer and I took out my personal checkbook. And I wrote a check to the church in the amount of $20 and I signed it, and I tore off the check, and I showed it to the little girl, and I said to her, I understand that you can't pay that penalty, and so I'm going to pay it for you. I said, do you know why I would want to do that? And she just had this look of shock on her face, and she said, no. And I said, because I love you because you matter to me, because you are valuable. And I want you to know, God feels the same way about you, except even more. And I handed her that check, and she grabbed it, and she held it to her heart, and she smiled, and it was like the weight of the world just lifted off of her shoulders, and she was like giddy with gratitude. I said, thank you, thank you, thank you. And this little girl who had walked into my office under such a weight of guilt and shame went skipping down the corridor out of my office that day. And here's what I want you to know. You and I need to do what that little girl did. We need to go to God. And we need to be honest with him. We need to tell the truth to him. We need to say, God, I have sinned. I know I have. It's like that little girl. I knew it was wrong when I did it, but 
but I've done things anyway. And I've fudged, and I've cheated, and I've lied, and I've used your name in vain, which is blasphemy. I've sinned a thousand times. And I want to admit that to you, and I want to confess it, and I want to turn from it. I want to repent of it. Because what does our sin do? Our sin separates us from God. God is perfect. God is pure. God is holy. We're not. We're sinners. And this has created a gulf, a chasm between us. But God doesn't want it that way. God loves you. You are valuable to him. You matter to him. And so what did he do? He sent Jesus into the world to live the perfect life. Jesus, the the unique son of God. And what did Jesus do? He wrote a check to pay the penalty for your sin, and he wrote it in his own blood. In other words, he went to the cross, and he died. He paid the death penalty that you deserve and that I deserve for the sins we've committed so that we could be set free, so that our debt could be paid. And he offers this forgiveness and eternal life as a free gift of his grace. But here's the thing. Just like that little girl needed to accept the check that I wrote for her, and she clutched it to her heart because she was so overwhelmed with gratitude, we need to reach out. We need to receive this payment that Jesus made on the cross, receive it on our behalf. The Bible says in John 1, 12, that as many as received him, To them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name. Have you done that? Have you received personally the payment that God made on the cross through Jesus Christ to pay the penalty that you deserve? Have you received it? I hope you have, but if you haven't, why not do it now? Why not do it today? Why not do it today so that the rest of your life, if you ever wonder, where do I stand with God? Am I really a child of God? Am I really adopted into his family? If I die today, am I going to go to heaven? Whenever those questions come up in your mind, you can say, whoa, 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 wait a minute. I remember that day when I prayed with Lee right there through the internet. And you can know for sure, Jesus, you know, Jesus wants us to know for sure. The Bible says, these things are written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God in order that you may know that you have eternal life. God doesn't want you guessing or in a state of ambiguity or confusion. You can know. It begins with us telling the truth to God that we're sinners. So let me offer you this opportunity. Just pray these words if you want to take that step. Just say, Lord Jesus, I do Just like that little girl, I confess that I am a sinner. Just like her, I've done things I knew they were wrong, and I did them anyway. I've sinned. I've sinned a thousand times. And I'm sorry. I confess it. And I want to turn from it. And in an attitude of repentance and faith, I want to receive this free gift of forgiveness and eternal life that you, Jesus, purchased on the cross when you died as my substitute to pay for all of my sin. Thank you for writing the check for my penalty in your blood so that we could be reconciled forever starting today, and for eternity in heaven. Help me, Jesus, to live the kind of life that you want me to live. Because from this moment on, I am yours. And now, Father, we celebrate those that have taken that step just now and, 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 and through this weekend. We're just thrilled with that. Because we know, we know what awaits them, a relationship with you through your son, Jesus Christ, and an eternity with you in heaven. So we celebrate your grace, your love for us. 
And we thank you that we can be part of a church that unabashedly proclaims the truth of your gospel, the truth about your grace, and that serves so many people, that puts your love into action, your grace into action, serving people who are hurting in the midst of these difficult times. Thanks for letting us be part of that. And we pray for your blessing on each and every person who even at this very time has entered into your family forever. In Jesus' name, amen.